And I have for you is where have you been? We've missed you. We haven't seen you here in Iowa. We haven't seen you a whole lot in the national media. Where have you been? Well, we've been working hard. And obviously, it's a big country, so we spent a lot of time in the key states where it's going to be decided. And obviously, we've been in Iowa a few times. We were just here a few weeks ago for the fair. We're back again now for a couple of days, and we'll be here a lot, especially in the fall, uh, beginning around this period of time. We've, there's also other states that have a a role to play in this election process. So we've been there as well, whether it's New Hampshire, Nevada, South Carolina. And then, of course, I have a, a full-time job as well as a U.S. Senator. So we've been trying to juggle all that, but we feel real good about it, and we're, we're looking forward to, to being here often. You're actually now tied for fifth in the polls in Iowa without having been here, frankly, as much as some of the other candidates who are below you in the polls. So is that strategy working for you, or do you intend to actually um, ramp up uh, the frequency of your appearances in Iowa and your organizational staff on Well, as we get closer, we'll most certainly have more time here, and we've got a good group now as well working. We have a plan, and our plan is to try to be in the best position possible in January and February when the voting counts, not in August and September when it's just opinion. And as you've seen, those numbers fluctuate, and so you really can't allow them to get in your head. Look, when I ran for the U.S. Senate, I was down 30, 40 points. My opponent was the governor of Florida, who was a Republican. I had the entire establishment against me in Washington. And that was the same question I got for months. Why are you trailing by 30 or 40 points? Do you even have a chance? But we believed in our message, and we believed in our plan, and we executed it. And sure enough, by April of that year, not only was he not my opponent in the primary, he had changed parties and running as an independent. So I'm not saying that's going to happen here. I think we're going to have a vibrant race till the end. But I feel very comfortable in what we're doing, and in particular in what we're running on and what our message is. Okay. And you s just spoke of experience. Now, uh, you're a young guy, but you do have some political experience in a race that, at least with the, uh, the emergence of Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders, um, there's there's... Is experience really all that important? You kind of have a foot in both camps. Well, I think we have a more fundamental problem. In my lifetime, there's never been a time where the political establishment in either party has been more out of touch with everyday Americans than it is now. There is a massive disconnect, in particular, between Washington and the daily lives of our people. And, unless we ch and the result is they have put us on a path that will lead to America's decline. What I mean by that is we will be the first generation in our history to leave our children worse off than ourselves. And so it seems like every election, whether it's for dog catcher, senator, or president, they roll out one of their buddies and say, this is who it's going to be this time, and we all need to line up behind them. That's what they told me when I ran for the U.S. Senate um, in 2010. That's what they told me now when I ran for president, that I needed to wait my turn. But the truth behind is... Behind Jeb Bush? or, yeah, or well, Whoever it who? may be. The bottom line mm -hmm. is some of these people with all the so-called experience, they're the ones that put us on this track to begin with. We need to turn the page, embrace new leaders with new ideas for a new century. And if we do that, we have a chance at the greatest era in our history. If we continue doing what we're doing now, we will be the first Americans ever who leave their children worse off than themselves. A, a majority of Republican caucus goers right now in Iowa are telling us that uh, Washington experience is a bad thing. But I've, I've heard you campaigning and defending to people who ask questions about being a one-term senator and how that's plenty of experience to be president. Yeah. Um, is, it, is it time for you to start advertising, hey, I'm only a one-term senator, I don't have that much Washington Well, I am experience. who I am. I've had an opportunity to be in office before. I was the state speaker of the House, obviously, in the legislature in Florida is a part-time thing. It's not a full-time job, but it's an important job, and I'm proud to have served there. And then term limits kicked in, and I was out of office. And I chose to get back into public service in 2010, despite having to confront the entire establishment of the Republican Party, because I believe this country was headed in the wrong direction, and if it continued, I would leave for my children a country worse than the one my parents left for me, and I don't want any part of that. And that's why I'm running for president now, and I think my argument is, all this stuff about experience, I remind people that the people who have put us in this mess to begin with are some of these people with all the so-called experience, experience at making mistakes. Most of the people, though, that uh, are looking for experience outside of Washington are looking for somebody who has run a company, um, who has done something else. What, what, talk well, a, little, a, talk a little bit about your experience outside of Washington. Yeah. Well, that's a valid argument as well. Obviously, I've had an honor to serve in public service. As I've outlined, I was the Speaker of the Florida House, where real government matters the most at the state and local level. And so we did things. For example, we have, we, uh, in the, after the Supreme Court a few years ago ruled on a case uh, that basically said that governments could take your private property and give it to another property owner, because, a taking. It was a kilo decision in the Supreme Court. Florida, uh, even before I was Speaker, I helped pass both a constitutional amendment and a law that prohibited that from ever happening in Florida. As Speaker, we did a lot of things. We reformed the curriculum in Florida without Common Core which is where it belongs at the state level. And then term limits came, and I was out. I was an attorney. I did land use and zoning. I was home raising my kids. And then I saw what was happening with the Obama agenda. 
And I, I wanted our next U.S. Senator to be someone that would go to Washington, stand up to that agenda, and offer a clear alternative. And I knew the governor of Florida, who was a so-called Republican at the time, wouldn't do it. So I took him on. I was down 40 points in the polls. The only people that thought I could win all lived in my home. Four of them were under the age of 10. But we ran and we won. And now, after four and a half years in the U.S. Senate, I've, I'm, I'm not running for re-election to the Senate, because I've realized that the only way we're going to change directions is by having a president with ideas and a vision for the 21st century. We don't have that right now in either party. Okay, and shifting gears a little mm -hmm. bit here, let's move to immigration. At one point, you sponsored a comprehensive immigration reform uh, bill. Uh, where do you stand on Donald Trump's proposal to build a wall and well, there are 11 and a half million people out of the country? Well, there are elements of it that we've been for for a long time. For example, we do need more border security. Elements of? Well, of, of things he talks about. He mm -hmm. didn't invent them. The notion that we need better security in our southern border it's something people have been talking about for 30 years. But and does a wall make sense? Well, in certain portions it does. People don't cross every part of the border. There are parts of the border that are crossing corridors. In essence, they are areas that are near an interstate highway that lead to a major city. That's where people are crossing. They don't cross to a, 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 a dangerous mountainous region because they won't make the journey. Those are the places where walls and more personnel and cameras and sensors and these sorts of things will help secure the border. But that won't be enough. 40% of illegal immigrants enter legally. They overstay a visa. That's why you need mandatory e-verify, and that's why you need an entry-exit tracking system so that in real time you know who's in this country legally and who isn't. You have to do all of those things, and that's the first thing. Then you've got to modernize our legal immigration system so that it's no longer family-based. It becomes merit-based. And I think after we've done those two things, the American people will be very reasonable with what you do with someone who's been here for 20 years and isn't a criminal. If they're a criminal, they can't stay. If they're not, I think people will be very reasonable, because I don't believe we're going to round up and deport 11 million people. I don't think we can. I don't think the American people will support it or what it means to do it, and I, I know that we won't. So we've got to be reasonable about that, but not until the other two things happen first. But do you think that the way Donald Trump is talking about immigration is going to make people less reasonable when it comes down to uh, issues of dealing with folks who are already here. Um, it seems like he's m moved the needle um, on how people are thinking about this immigration issue and moving it to the right. I don't know. I mean, Seventy percent of Republicans don't support Donald Trump, the fact, the fact, despite the fact that he's on television all the time and saying the things he says. He'll have his moment. He'll have his chance. He himself has described himself as an entertainer in the last few days and commenting on what he said about Carly Fiorina, which was outrageous. So he'll get his moment in the sun and he'll enjoy himself. But ultimately, this election is going to have to be a serious one. Because if we get it wrong this time, if we get it wrong this time, it's going to be very difficult to correct course. We'll still be an important country, but we'll lose the American dream, which makes us great. So how do you shift it from what some people would call the absurd to the serious? Now? It will happen. Voters, especially in places like Iowa, are going to take that very seriously. What I, one of the things I've learned in my visits here is that the caucus goers in Iowa, as they do in other early states, take their role very seriously. They understand that we are making a selection here, you're beginning to select here, the next leader of the free world, the leader of the most powerful military arsenal in all of human history, someone who isn't just lead the leader of the government, but in many ways the leader of our country. And they take that role very seriously. And I'm optimistic about the direction this campaign, this debate will head as we get closer but to doesn't February. But doesn't the emergence of Donald Trump, of people who don't have uh, governmental experience, Bernie Sanders, show an anger in the electorate that, that maybe you should be concerned the same with? I'm not, I, I have the same concern. I'm in, I, I have a first row seat to this dysfunction. I see it every day. We leave my family every early in the week and fly to Washington and get up there and are told repeatedly, well, there's nothing we can do. Then we get the majority in the Senate and there's still nothing we can do. The Iran deal is a perfect example. The American people overwhelmingly do not support that deal. And yet the Democratic Party has ignored that and is walking the plank for purposes of round, you know, circling the wagons to protect the president's legacy. And the Republican leadership is treating it like if it's just a, another vote on another issue. Let's just get through it procedurally and move on to the next issue. This is an issue of the highest order. It's about the security of the world and of our country, about a radical Shia cleric in Iran obtaining a nuclear weapon, and it's being treated like it's a bill on a highway funding Do you uh, take option. this issue to court if Absolutely. Congress is, mm -hmm. uh, and, and what, what's the argument? I think, first of all, you do everything possible. We look for ways to impose additional sanctions. We look for all creative ways to go after American banks or any financial institutions in the world that are helping Iran arm itself and fund itself. But we also go to court and make the fundamental argument that this is illegal, that the president has not submitted 
the entirety of the deal to Congress, and therefore he cannot move forward on even a vote, and, and it won't be valid until he does so, until those secret side deals between the IAEA and Iran are revealed to the American public. That was the whole reason for passing that Corker bill which created this process to begin with, and it's just basically being ignored. One, one of the issues that has arisen um, that actually divides the Republican field to some extent is the issue of Kim Davis and religious mm -hmm. liberty, and whether uh, a, a clerk of court uh, in uh, Kentucky should keep her job if she's unwilling to issue uh, marriage licenses to same-sex couples as the Supreme Court has required. You've said there ought to be some way for her to keep her job, correct? Yes. And, and how, how, would, how could that happen? Well, a couple of what she has set up, my understanding of what she says is she doesn't want her name on the certificates and doesn't want to personally have to authorize them. And I don't think she be, should be compelled to do so. I think there, there should be another individual identified within her office that will do that. And in fact, I think if people have conscientious, religious-based, uh, you know, objections to same-sex marriage, they should basically be able to state those early on and never be asked to do that. And, and no one will know because you'll have someone in the clerk's office who doesn't have that objection who's willing to sign so it. So you're accommodating That's, her religious yeah. uh, objection while the office still continues to do its job. Right. Job. So Utah has figured this out. I mean, Utah passed a law a few months ago that deals with these sorts of things. But, you know, this is part of a broader problem. This is what happens when the Supreme Court ignores the rules of our republic and rams down the throat of the American people a made-up constitutional right. I've argued consistently that if you want to change the definition of marriage, go to your state legislature and have a debate there and let them vote on it. They're the representatives of our people and people can vote for or against them if they agree or disagree. We, there, I did not agree that courts should be doing it, nor do I believe that there's a federal constitutional but right. But one of the okay. reasons why the Supreme Court got involved is there are consequences for people across state lines, uh, whether a state recognizes their marriage No, or but not. The, con the Constitution already deals with that. The Equal Protection Clause, the full faith and credit realities that exist in the Constitution, they require states to recognize what other states have authorized. That, that, that issue that the Constitution already addresses, whether we agree with it or not, what's wrong here is that the Supreme Court has told states, including states like Florida, where people voted overwhelmingly by over 60 percent in a constitutional amendment, voted to define marriage as one man and one woman, they're telling us that that doesn't matter, that there's a federal constitutional right that somehow some of the most brilliant legal minds in 200 years of American jurisprudence never spotted, but now these five geniuses on the Supreme Court did. Okay, and that leads in perfectly to my next question. Now, back in July, you spoke at the Family Leadership Summit in Ames, and you said, forgive me, I have to read this. Quote, we have an attorney general and a Supreme Court that will not stand up for the rights of every American family to instill in their children traditional values without being persecuted or discriminated against by government or by society. What yes. exactly did you mean by I'll that? I'll give you multiple examples. A Chick-fil-A in Denver that was the, the local government tried to deny them a permit to operate in the airport because of the religious views of the owners. People across this country that provide professional services, a photographer, the, you know, the, you know, the baker that everybody talks about, individuals who have said, you know, we won't stand in the way of your ceremonies, but we don't personally want to be involved in being contracted services for it because it, we don't, it's not that we discriminate against you, the person, but we, our faith does not allow us to work on an event that, that our faith disagrees with. And those are civil rights as well and they deserve to be defended. Our religious liberties are equal to any other liberties that are instilled in the Constitution, and they also deserve to be defended. And I believe that in the years to come, there will be a number of challenges to religious liberties. You will see more of these local governments targeting companies whose owners have views they don't agree with, like what happened in Denver. If those sorts of things happen, we need to have an attorney general that will defend them, a civil rights division of the Justice Department that will fight just as hard for Americans with traditional values as they do for Americans who believe in same-sex marriage or any other issue. I relate to that to the defunding of Planned Parenthood. How does that principle apply? Well, that's a different principle. Planned Parenthood is an organization. They do not have a right to, to receive federal funding. They receive federal funding because policymakers in the past believed that because of the services they provided, they were worthy of federal funding. I believe they have lost that right, I, I, that they have lost that privilege because of what these videos have revealed. And so what I've argued is, let's take the money that Planned Parenthood gets, let's not cut a penny, and let's take it from Planned Parenthood and give it to federally qualified health centers across this country who provide services to women, women's health services, but do not provide abortions. There is a strong bipartisan consensus in America that taxpayer money should not be used to fund abortions. And in the case of Planned Parenthood, number one, it is very unclear how all that money is intermingled, and number two, they have now been exposed. 
for being involved in the trafficking of fetal human tissue yeah, but what uh, do you, for what profit. Do you, what do you say to the people who have medical issues that that fetal tissue has helped provide medical research and has helped these people live better lives? What do you say to those So people? there are cases, we're not getting into the weeds on it, but it's an important question. And there are cases where a child is miscarried or there's some other you know, natural end to a pregnancy. And in those cases, if there's something that can be salvaged from it that could help someone else, we're for it no different than organ donation, where unfortunately someone who's young and healthy dies in a car accident. And there, I've had a relative who died uh, an untimely death, and his organs were harvested and uh, helped save people and, and provide organs for them. That's different from saying we're going to take the fetal tissue of aborted fetuses, because now what you've done is you've created an industry. Now what you've done is you've created an incentive for people to be pushed into abortions so that those tissues can be harvested and sold Don't for a profit. Don't you think that's a stretch, pushing no. people into abortions? Absolutely. If you go to one of these centers, young women are provided very few options. In many places, they're not told anything about, for example, adoption services that might be available to them. Uh, the idea that, in essence, you come in and it's already predetermined. This is the direction that this, this is what this place does. It provides abortions, and we are going to channel you in that direction. And uh, I just think you've created an industry now where you've created the situation where very much you created an incentive for people not just to look forward to having more abortions but being able to sell that fetal tissue for purposes uh, the centers for purposes of making a profit off of it as you've seen in some but, of these Planned Parenthood affiliates. But Planned Parenthood does not make a profit off of this. They only recover their cost. Well, again, th that's unclear. And that's one of the things I hope the IRS will look into, as well as the Justice Department. You have these affiliates around the country meeting with who they believe are firms involved in this process. And they're talking about the idea that this is how we can, th th these are more profitable transactions for the organization. It raises more money for the organization. It allows it to bring more money in. The videos at least raise the specter of that. And I think it deserves a full investigation by both the Justice Department, because that would be a practice that's illegal, and the IRS. And, and none of those two things are happening right now. Speaking of people who have few options, uh, the, the president has said uh, that the U.S. should have uh, 10,000 refugees from the Syrian crisis uh, come into the United States um, without waiving the 18 to 24 month background check that is normally involved. Um, some have criticized that saying um, that is not nearly enough for the United States to take. Um, others have raised concerns about um, the possibility of terrorists being among the Syrian refugees. Where do you come down on that? Well, I, I've, there's always been a place in America for refugees and we should continue to be a country that provides. Um, is 10,000 the right number? I don't know what the right number is. It's enormous. I mean, you're talking about 4 million people. So ten, whether it's even 100,000, you won't notice a dramatic difference. Ultimately, Europe is being disproportionately impacted because of its vicinity. We've had migratory crises in America as well, you know, whether it's a Haitian, before that Cubans, and certainly we see what's happening now in the northern triangle of Central America, where, for example, a migratory crisis two years ago, because of insecurity, led to a bunch of minors being sent here unaccompanied. So we face our own migratory crisis to begin with at a different scale, obviously. I think that we need to do more to help our allies in the region deal with the costs of housing all these people. Obviously, I think we should play a role. Now, you're talking about another jump across the Atlantic Ocean, so it's even further away from their home, so there's logistical challenges involved. We but cannot the ignore the security. Issue. It's real. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the things that slows this process down, is doing a background check on someone who arrives on a raft is not easy. Nope. Uh, there are no government to call in Syria and ask them, is this person a terrorist or not? So it's a difficult process. And we can't ignore the fact that there are terrorists that could take advantage of this process to gain access to the United States. I don't think it'll be anywhere close to a majority, but if it's one person, it could be a very dangerous thing. So it's a difficult issue that we ho I hope we don't politicize and can work through. The ultimate solution is to create a, a comprehensive strategy for the Middle East that brings stability back to that region. Many of these people don't want to move to America or Europe. They're there by force. They want to return to their ancestral homelands. This is particularly true for ancient Christian communities that have been driven from the area uh, for the first time in 2,000 years. And, and I think so I think the better approach is a, is a strategy like the one I've outlined that will allow us not just to defeat ISIS, but radicalism and help create an environment where countries can begin to build a stable government and a stable environment. In the short term, would you be open to taking more than 10,000 refugees? And would you be open to shortening the background check time? Well, I would not in favor of shortening. Uh, obviously, if there's anything we can do to make the background check more efficient, I would be open to that and more effective. But I'm not sure I'm willing to sacrifice security for purposes of that. I don't think at this age, given the challenges we see around the world with radical jihadists and the way that threat has evolved, 
that we're in a position to be doing that. But I most certainly am open to, to finding the right number and what our appropriate contribution. We need to do our part. And I would also go on to say that the UN is dealing with a lot of this, and the United States is the single greatest funder of UN programs. So I would argue we've already done more than any other country to help address some of these challenges. Are you concerned that this is going to be further destabilizing in Europe that is already dealing with the Greek uh, crisis, Greek financial well, it's, crisis? Well, it's a real impact. For example, Germany continues to accept more and more migrants, but there's a cost associated with it. Absolutely. Look at what's happened in Jordan. You have about a million migrants on their border. It's now the second largest, almost the largest city in all of Jordan is a refugee refugee camp. They're concerned about it destabilizing them. But this actually, what it does is if anyone ever had any temptation to be an isolationist or believe that we could ignore global events because it's something happening halfway around the world, this is a reminder of why we can't. Eventually, instability reaches us. We are the most powerful and important country on the planet. Millions of people would love to live here if they could. If there is danger and instability anywhere in the world, it will eventually impact America. And this migratory crisis is an example of it. We're being asked about it now, even though it's happening half a world away. It is a consequence, partially, of a failed Obama foreign policy. Okay. You are a 43-year-old man. You are of a different generation. Than I'm 44, but I feel 45. 44. Okay. <laughs> I feel 45. Okay. But uh, you are of a different generation than many of the people you're running against. The American dream. Yeah. How do you continue that, and how, you, how do you define it now as a person of a different generation than the folks you're well, running Well, I, I still think it's the same fundamental dream. Actually, it, it's part of a universal hope that people have everywhere of a better life. You have a migratory crisis now in, in, in Europe because people hope for a better life. You have people get on rafts and come to America from the Caribbean because they're in search of a better life. It's called the American dream because people have been able to achieve a better life here and it's been so rare everywhere else. For me, the American dream is about happiness. It isn't about how much money you make or how famous you are or how many things you own. My dad was a bartender and my mother was a hotel maid and they achieved the American dream because they owned a home in a safe and stable neighborhood. They were able to retire with dignity and they were able to leave all four of their children better off than themselves. I want this to continue to be a country where that just isn't possible but possible for more people than ever. That is the fundamental challenge before the next president, other than national security, is to assure that that's still possible. I think we're losing it. If we stay on the road we're on right now, the American dream will be harder to achieve. And that's why I say we'll be the first generation to leave the next worse off. All right, Senator, we thank you for your thank time. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.